Are we? Hey, we're here. Hey, good morning. Welcome. Glad that you are here this morning. My name is Preston Kalesha. I get to lead our high schoolers and our young adults. Welcome. Glad that you could join us online. Uh, glad that you're here watching service as well. Hey, whether it's me or Pastor Brian or whoever else is up here teaching, our mission is always the same. We exist to lead everyone to discover Jesus and follow him fully. So glad you could be here with us today. Hey, uh, did everyone have a good short week? We all, we all had a good, yeah, good. Uh, did anyone mix up days all week long? Because that's all I did. It's all the whole week. Um, <clears throat> we had a short week because of Memorial Day. Hope you had a good long weekend. Uh, and I want to tell you the story of the three hardest lines ever spoken in American wartime history. Uh, we all know the story of Alvin York, right? No? Okay, I didn't either, so it's okay. Alvin York delivered the three coldest lines in all of American war history. I want to tell you about it. Uh, Alvin and his uh, group of soldiers, his team, they were fighting in World War I. Uh, they were engaged in some trench warfare, and uh, to put it simply, his entire squad was wiped out by a German machine gun nest. Uh, he had two choices. He could go and take care of what needed to be done, or he could try and escape, and he took care of what needed to be done. He duck squatted through this trench, which I can't, I'm not physically capable of showing you, okay? But he was duck squatting way low. And he crawled through the trench and got to this machine gun nest, took care of business, and all of a sudden, he peered over the machine gun nest, and he saw hundreds of German soldiers all just sitting there, prepping for battle, resting, relaxing, doing all this stuff. And, uh, well, Alvin York did more of what he needed to do. And at some point, a German officer runs up to him and waves a white shirt or a white flag, and he said, sir, 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 stop, stop, we surrender, we surrender. He said, sir, are you English? And Sergeant York delivered the first hardest line in all of American war. He said, no, sir, I'm an American. Mm. <laughs> that goes pretty hard, right? And then he, he said, I will surrender. And Sergeant York said, fine, come with me back to camp. And so Sergeant York marched 132 German soldiers single-handedly back to the American camp. When he arrived, his officers looked at him and said, York, it looks like you got the entire German army to surrender where Sergeant York delivered the second coldest line, which is, uh, no, sir, I only got 132 of them. Mm, <laughs> that's pretty tough, right? And then finally they said, well, how'd, you, how'd you do it, York? You and 132 of them? And the best line is Sergeant York looked at them and he said, well, sir, it was simple. I just surrounded them. Oh, that goes crazy. The one dude surrounded all of them? He makes it. Listen, I... I am ready to run through a brick wall for this guy, okay? Like, this is, I don't know who those 132 are out there that I need to take care of for who knows what, but I, I gotta get them, right? Like, that's, that's just, it's inspiring, man. He makes it seem so simple. Until I remember that a couple years ago, I took a group of fifth graders here at the church to go play paintball in an event, and what I knew was if I hid inside the little castle for long enough, they would all shoot all their paintballs, and then I would be the only one left with paintballs, and I could come out and, you know, cause havoc. And so they moved me from fifth grade to high school, and now I'm here with, working with high schoolers. But like I, it, it seems so simple with this Alvin York guy. He makes it seem so easy, but like I think about who I am, and no matter how simple he made it look, the complexities of my situation and who I am and my lack of bravery in the fifth grade battlefield means that it's not so simple for me. There are people who make things seem really simple, but it's really anything but sometimes. We're, we're in a series about serving called Ripple Effects, and we hear like, stories about some amazing service that people do. Like we hear about the woman who packs up her life and moves to a third world country to go be a missionary and preach and teach and just bring people to Jesus everywhere she goes and and we get inspired by it. And we go, yeah, that, I could do that. And so we go home and we start looking on travel sites and looking up plane tickets and we get the foreign language on our little Duolingo and we're ready. But then we think about the complexity of our family and well, it, it's not realistic to raise our kids in a third world country, right? And so we, we close the plane tabs and we delete Duolingo. It wasn't gonna help anyway. You see, it's just not that simple for us. Or you had kids or students who, like, they were poured into by a leader. And you think, you know what, now my kids and students, they're not really kids and students, so it's my turn to go and pour into someone else. And you start to apply to be a tag team member or serve with students or kids. 
and then you think about it, and the complications of your financial situation is that if you're serving with students, you can't pick up that overtime. And so you don't finish the application. You see, there are all sorts of situations in our life, especially when it comes to serving, where something seems really simple. It seems so direct. Hey, just do this. But the complexities of our situation just make it so it's not that simple. So we're left with a question, like, how do you simply serve in a world that's anything but simple? There's so many complications with it. Since 1988, Nike has been telling us, just do it, man. Just get it done. Simply do it. And it looks great on a billboard, but it's not the same in our life, huh? Now, hear me on this. All of your reasons, all of my reasons, they're not excuses. They're not excuses to try and get out of doing something. No, they're real valid reasons for a real valid life. There are reasons that we can't move to the third world country. There are reasons that we can't be a high school leader. There are reasons that we can't do these simple acts of service that it make it seem so easy to others, but our life has some complication to it. And so I want to evaluate a question today that I just I want all of us to ponder because I've asked it of myself and I wonder if you have too. The question we're going to talk about is how do you simply serve in a complicated world? That's what we're going to talk about. How do you simply serve in a world that's so complex? And thankfully, this is not Preston time. This is Bible time. So we're going to look at the scriptures to find our answer. So today we're going to be looking at Luke 19 verses 1 through 10. If you want to look at your Bibles, you can check it out there, or your Bible app, the Crossroads app, or if you ever need a Bible in the Welcome Center out there, there are copies for you to have. And so we have this story in the Bible that helps us answer the question, how do you simply serve in a complicated world? And the story is actually about Zacchaeus. And if, if you know the story of Zacchaeus, you know it's like 10 verses long, it's really short, and I, I think it's pretty cool that this short little story in the Bible has its own theme song. I think it, do you, do you guys know the theme song? Do you know the Sunday school song? Listen, I'm, all right, I'm not gonna sing the Sunday school song. It's fine. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in that sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And when the Savior passed that way, he looked up in that tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. That's worship. You're welcome. That's the Sunday school song. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's right. I, pretty good, I know. Listen, if you know that song, then you know the story of Zacchaeus. And you also probably know how to dial on a rotary phone, okay? Good for you. I don't, I don't know how. But if you don't know that song, that's fine. We don't, like, they don't sing it really anymore. They don't teach it. Uh, I think it's because we collectively all decided that it's not very nice to call a short person a wee little man. Except for wee man, I think. He, he gave himself that name, though. That wasn't like, well, I don't think we did that. I think he... But that's beside the point. The song, the little Sunday school song, makes the story seem so simple, right? It's just a simple little song. But there's more complexity to it. You see, much like our life, the song makes it seem really simple, but it's way more complicated than that. And if you would, I'd like to walk through the complications of that story and that time and that culture. So today, we're going to be looking at Luke 19, and we're going to start right in verse 1. Here we go. 19.1, Jesus entered through Jericho and was passing through. We see that Jesus is going through Jericho. What do we know right now? Well, one, Jesus was at the peak of his popularity pre-crucifixion. Jesus had been spending the last couple of years teaching and preaching and healing and performing miracles. He'd been doing all sorts of stuff. He was by no means anonymous. To the point that in a couple of verses in this very same chapter, we get to see what is known as Palm Sunday today or when Jesus walks into Jerusalem and is heralded and worshiped as king by many of those who were there. So Jesus is a pretty big deal at the time. We also know he's a big deal because there was a crowd there to see him, such a crowd that our short king Zacchaeus couldn't see through. And there we meet Zacchaeus, 19 verse 2. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. We learn two things about Zacchaeus. One, he's a tax collector. Two, he's got a bunch of cash. Here's what we know about tax collectors in the Bible. Uh, To put it lightly, not great. They don't love tax collectors back then. And it makes sense. Like, the whole job description of a tax collector was just inherently built to not only love Rome and the government more than their own people, but it was also a job that in its job description had 
extortion and you know all sorts of treating people unfairly and cheating people. It was just built into the job description itself. Here's how it worked. Rome would say, here's a town. You can bid on who gets to tax this town. And so all these tax collectors would put in bids to tax the town, to have the rights to tax it. They would pay Rome a flat fee, and then the city would be taxed by that tax collector at whatever rate they wanted. Because they got to tax them for, one, what they paid Rome, but two, a little bit on top. And Zacchaeus isn't just a tax collector. What does it call him? He's the chief tax collector. The Greek word for chief tax collector is architolonus. It's the only time in the Greek New Testament that we see that word used. Zacchaeus is the only reference chief tax collector in all of the New Testament. Why is that important? Because what happens is Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector, and he had a bunch of little tax collectors underneath him that took money from people who took their own money and then gave money to Zacchaeus. It's like a really convoluted like MLM pyramid scheme type thing going on right there. And Zacchaeus is at the tippy top. He's right there making all this money. So he's not just a bad guy. He is the biggest and baddest guy, physical stature aside. He is the face of all that is evil. In fact, John O'Hanlon described him in a book studying Zacchaeus. He called Zacchaeus the sinner supreme, which is a pretty sick title if you're a wrestler in WWE. Not a great name if you're just a regular dude. The sinner supreme. So the sinner supreme is the chief tax collector, and he's wealthy, which means what? He's real good at his job. He's taking money all over the place, just building himself an empire. Zacchaeus. The sinner supreme. It gets a bit more complicated with Zacchaeus, doesn't it? It's not as simple as a little song, and it just keeps going in verse 3 and 4. Verse 3, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Here's the thing that I don't really understand about this story. Um, <clears throat> If this whole crowd of people was there to see Jesus, how could none of them let him inch their way through to go see Jesus, right? Like, put it this way. Um, hi, my name is Preston. I, uh, I shop in the big and tall section uh, at stores. Uh, it's because I'm big and tall, okay? Like, that's, it's fine. It's all good. That's the reason why. And with being big and tall, there are some realities that you need to understand. For example, group picture time. Where do you go? Back row, one of the corners. Smile nice, right? If I'm, if, you know, I'm uh, in someone's way, like in service, I tell Pastor Brian all the time, hey, I'm not taking a nap. I'm just slouching so people can see over my head. I want them to see you, Brian. He doesn't believe me, but it's okay. There's some realities that you need to know. And with that is like when I'm in an outdoor concert, I'm at a parade, right? There's someone behind me. I'm going to try and let that person squeeze in front of me so I can see above them and they can see, I don't know, Mickey Mouse walk by on the parade. It's just common courtesy. And you mean to tell me that a group of people who came to the gates of Jericho to see Jesus, who knew about his miracles and his teachings and his healings and his preaching, not a single one of them was kind enough to let the short dude step on in front of them? Those people don't know Jesus very well, do they? How could they? If I know that now, how could they not know? But remember who we're talking about. We're talking about Zacchaeus, the sinner supreme. Because here's the reality. If I'm at that outdoor parade, and there's a guy trying to see around me from behind me, <clears throat> and I turn and look at him, and I see the face of the guy who swooped in and took my parking space that I was sitting there with my blinker on waiting for. Y'all know the people. You're sitting there with a blinker on waiting. And if you're that person, we can pray after. It's okay. If I see that guy and he's the one behind me, you best believe I'm using all bit of my big and tall to make sure he doesn't get any glimpse of Mickey Mouse, okay? He doesn't deserve Mickey. That's what I'm saying with him. These people in the crowd, this is Zacchaeus, sinner supreme. We know not just from his job, not just from his wealth, not just from his status in the community, but the way the community treats him, Zacchaeus is a bad dude. And not just a bad dude, but a bad dude with a bad rap. His situation is complicated. It's complex. There's more to it than simply the mean guy. These people can't stand Zacchaeus, and they treat him as such. And when we start to understand more of the complexities of Zacchaeus, 
we can start to see how radical this next situation is. So let's look at it, verse five. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. These people are all there to see Jesus. They all know what he's about, and they're shocked when he talks to a sinner? Spoiler alert, that's Jesus' whole MO. He's just about sinners, man. We're all sinners, and he's for all of us. Haven't they heard, do they not know, about Jesus' interactions with the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the outcasts, the sinners, all of them? They should know, right? And Zacchaeus' relationship with the community and Zacchaeus' situation and standing was so complicated, was so complex that not even an understanding of Jesus' treatment of sinners could overcome it. Zacchaeus' situation was complicated. I remember about a year ago, my life, my life was absurdly complicated. Like I, in, I could not get out of my head all the things that were happening. It was the new house. It was a new baby. We had a toddler in the home. It was shifting jobs. It was stuff with family back in Arizona. Like it was, there was so much happening, and I could not get out of my head just how complicated and overwhelming my life felt. And so what I do a lot of times is, like, whenever I feel overwhelmed or contemplated or stressed, I, I just like to go out and just in nature and just, just walk and try and get it all out of my head. And so this day, I, I took my daughter, who was two at the time. Her name is Ada. Uh, and we went out to uh, Knight's Ferry. Y'all know Knight's Ferry? Yeah, it's 12 minutes from my house. Oakdale forever. What's up? And um, we went out to Knight's Ferry, and we were just walking. And normally, like, that, that clears my mind. But uh, I could not get out of my head. Everything was just so jumbled, so complicated. My life felt like it couldn't unravel anything from the complicated rat's nest that it was. And I'm walking along and just trying to figure it out. And at some point, my daughter, <laughs> she stops. And she squats on the ground. And she just picks up some rocks. <laughs> and she just starts playing with these pebbles. I'm like, Ada, come on, we have rocks at home. Like, come on, we don't, let's go. And she was not budging, dude. These, these were her rocks. And she was just sitting there playing with them. And I'm like, Ada, come on, we came all this way. 12 minutes. We came all this way. Look at the, the raging river. Look at the mountains and the rock formations and the trees and the grass and the flowers and the animals and the butterflies. Look at all that. We don't have that at home. And all she cared about were these simple little rocks. And I don't know how she did it, but my two-year-old in that moment was teaching me a lesson on simplicity that I could not have comprehended 13 minutes before. She was just so interested in the simplicity of what was in front of her. She wasn't stressed about all the complicated things. And I'm sitting here, and I'm turning this all through my mind, and I take a step back to really like visualize it and to take a picture of her, admittedly for a sermon series at some point, realistically. I'm going to use it for a sermon. And I'm taking a picture and I'm, I'm just so blown away by this truth my daughter just taught me. And then my beautiful, perfect two-year-old daughter lets loose the loudest fart a two-year-old has ever let loose. And she stands up and drops her rocks and says, all done, and then walks away. <laughs> Dude, listen, it was more simple than even I was trying to make it. It was not about the rocks. My two-year-old was not teaching me a cosmological truth about the universe that I didn't understand. She was not teaching me a lesson. She was not showing me with some crazy metaphor. No, my two-year-old daughter had the fart. It was so simple. Even in my breakdown of the complexity of the simplicity that I was talking about it was so much more complicated than it really was. Come on, man. We make things so complicated, don't we? We just see the complications in the world. We just see the complications in our situation. Let me ask you, do you think Jesus was blindsided by the complexity of Zacchaeus' life? Do you think he didn't know? No, no. What happened when Jesus came up to Zacchaeus? He greeted him, what? By name. 
He said Zacchaeus. He knew Zacchaeus. He knew Zacchaeus' life. He knew his past. He knew his history. He knew his standing in the community. He knew his situation. He knew the complexity all around it. And Jesus Christ went to him, and he said, you, I have a solution for you. And his solution was so simple. It was so direct that it's shocking. Let's read verse 5 one more time. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Through all of that complexity, Jesus' solution was dinner. That's it. And Jesus said, hey, dinner will solve all this. Now, thank goodness I don't have that responsibility to Jesus because I would have taken three to five business days, a team of HR, a team of PR, and a team of any other R acronym you can think of, to try and come up with a solution because it's a complicated situation. It deserves a complicated solution, right? But Jesus shows us so much different. And Jesus shows us the simplicity that it had. Now, let me, let me take us a step away from our American context for a second because at first glance, Jesus going to a guy and saying, you there, make me dinner, seems a bit rude, okay? But if we think of the culture at the time, we have to recognize that it was actually incredibly, like it was serving Zacchaeus, it was giving him such a high honor to be allowed to serve Jesus. We know this because the guest of honor at a home was treated so incredibly like well by just the community that if you were to associate yourself with someone like that, man, that was an act of service. As one author put it, Jesus knew the cost of being with Zacchaeus and it cost him to be the object of ostracism. Jesus knew what was happening. He knew he was serving him. The other way, not just understanding the culture, but just reading the text, how does the crowd react when Jesus says, you there, make me dinner? Because if that was like a rude thing, the crowd would be like, yeah, yeah, get him, get him. Yeah, you make it, make it, make it dinner. No, 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 the crowd's mad. They, they mutter, mutter, mutter. Yeah, oh, he's going to be a house with a Like, they're offended that Jesus went to go have dinner with Zacchaeus. Jesus serves Zacchaeus by having dinner with him. That's the solution. That's what we see. And what happens because of it? Verses 8 through 10 tell us. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to the house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. The situation around Zacchaeus was so complicated. We've unpacked the complications, and truthfully, there's more to it that we don't even get to see all of in just this story. And Jesus, through all of it, gives us an answer. We started by asking that question, how do you simply serve in a complicated world? And in 10 verses... Jesus lays it up to us. How do you simply serve in a complicated world? It's by serving simply. Do you think it was hard for Jesus to invite himself over for dinner? Yeah, it was impactful. Yeah, it mattered. But was it difficult? Serving simply is the answer that Jesus gives us when we ask how we serve in a complicated world. And sometimes it's easy to read a story from Jesus and try and figure out how it works in our own life. So I want to show you a story of my friend Sam and how he really has unpacked this in his life so we can see an answer from a person in our community today of how you simply serve in a complicated world by just serving simply. So take a look at my friend Sam. I'm Sam. Um, I'm a high school student. And I serve here at Crossroads on the production team doing stage cams. Um, for the worship sets and for other church events. And I also serve every Thursday in the preteens kids room as a small group leader, just trying to help the kids and lead them where I can. One of my favorite parts about serving on the tag team here is probably just the people that I get to work with. It's really fulfilling to just be in an environment where I'm walking in my faith with so many others who are also trying to do as much work for the Lord as they can. And it's just a really encouraging space and we all just feed off each other and it's just super fulfilling to 
be there and see. Paul was one of the leaders at or in the high school ministry on Sunday nights and I was first introduced to him through his crazy socks he would wear and just all the crazy things that he would yell at everybody. But um, Paul was a very wise man and I would I would get opportunities to talk about the Bible with him and get to know more about him and he would talk to me more like an equal than just a younger person. And um, there was one day where he invited me and a couple of my friends to a Bible study that he hosts at, I think it was in Mountain Mike's, or at Mountain Mike's Pizza. And it was just with a bunch of other students that I hadn't previously known before or that I just didn't even know went to our church. And it was just a really good environment to be led in, but to also just communicate with people in and just to see that I'm not the only one who has the struggles that I have and it was just really great to see a group of guys like that who were going through the same things as me and Paul really led all of us through that. It was through my experience at Hume Lake and um, my newfound like mentorship under Paul Calkins that was able to push me in different areas that I wouldn't have expected to be pushed in or that would have shined light on things I was unsure of or I guess just help me look at the things that I serve in or the areas that I serve in in a better light and more with a heart for God as for or as opposed to a heart for me. I always remember that there's just this one leader that I had who would always sit with me or always talk with me or hang out with me and make me feel like I actually had company. I think with that and also just with the opportunities that I had with Paul and just the ways that he led me, it encouraged me to want to provide that company for some of the kids in precincts who are a little bit more on the shy side or who don't like to get to know other kids. I just want to be able to have them walk into the precincts room and feel like they have someone to go to, even if they're not friends with all the kids, that they won't be alone. I think there's so much great opportunity in so many different areas that you can serve in, and there's so many different ways that you can use your talents in the church. It can be nerve-wracking at first, walking into new experiences, but you come out so much stronger, so much closer with the Lord afterwards, and I think it's just a really great thing that you don't want to miss out on. My name's Julian, and I'm in fifth grade. Um, having Sam as a leader is is really fun, and he teaches us how to honor and respect God and other people as well. Uh, having him as a leader is like really special to us and my friends. Let me tell you about Sam. He uh, <clears throat> he didn't want to brag, but. He also leads a Bible study for high schoolers before the high school service every single Sunday. He's been on every mission trip that the students have had since COVID. Uh, Sam is actively pouring into the life of kids under him, affecting peers at his level, and even inspiring adults above him. Quick sidebar from all this, uh, the students in this church are not the future. They are running the church right now. They are absolutely crushing. They are everywhere. They are serving everywhere. So if you have not plugged in with a student, if you have not connected with them, uh, I would highly encourage you, get plugged in with a student, see what they're doing, because they're doing some massive things. I mean, just walk through the kids' wing. I mean, half of them are high schoolers. It's amazing. So uh, quick aside on Sam, but Sam shows pretty clearly the answer to our question. How do you simply serve in a complicated world? And the other piece that we see is from the man that he referred to, Paul, Paul Calkins. Uh, and, and Paul, Paul, uh, <laughs> Paul was a huge impact in our community, with our students, and in our schools too. Uh, and when he, when he passed this past year, uh, his, his service, his funeral was here, and we just, we just saw story after story after story of people that he impacted. And did you see how he started his impact with Sam? Yeah, uh, it was pizza. Because breaking news, if you invite high schoolers to free pizza, they show up. It's a cra crazy thought. I don't know. He did it. He, he just went to Mountain Mike's. And he told me, I was like, why Mountain Mike's? He goes, because I don't have to do dishes. Like, that was, that's how simple it was, man. 
he, Paul knew, Sam knows, that the way that you can serve in such a complicated world is just by doing the simple things. It's by serving simply. That's the how that we're looking for. And Jesus' response to Zacchaeus through all the complications was as simple as dinner. But was dinner what changed Zacchaeus' life? Was pizza what changed Sam's trajectory? No. Because the how is a great question. We need to know how. We need to know the how to have strategy of what to do. But if we take the question, how do you simply serve in a complicated world, and we turn the diamond just a bit, we get the question that is my three-year-old and every three-year-old in the world's favorite question. Why? First of all, why plagues my household right now? It is, it is everywhere. It's all she asks. It's why on everything. And I want to just tell my daughter how. I don't want to tell her why she has to brush her teeth. I just want to tell her how to brush her teeth so her breath don't stink, okay? Like, that's, that's what I want to tell her. But the why is better for her, right? The why is better for her development, for her understanding. And when we look at this question, how do we serve in a complicated world, we can get the know-how from stories like Sam's or stories like Paul or the example of Jesus. But the why, the why gives us more. Jesus answers it so beautifully and so clearly. The why, he, he tells us why we serve in a complicated world. He tells us in verse 9 and 10. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham for the son of man has come to seek and save the lost. Jesus tells us why we need to serve. Why do you simply serve in a complicated world? It's because serving simply impacts people. That's what we do it for. We don't serve just to be nice and smile. We serve to impact people. Was dinner what changed Zacchaeus? No, an encounter with Jesus Christ is what changed Zacchaeus' life. And think about it. When you make that casserole for a family who's grieving, are you providing dinner for them? Yes, but what are you doing more? You are showing them the love of Jesus that a community can offer, right? When you hold a baby in the nursery, granted, my baby's cute, but you're not holding him for that. You're holding the baby so that a mother and a father can go into service and worship and commune with a community of believers who all proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. That's why our greeting team, they're not just smiling because it's nice to smile. They are being the front lines of someone's first interaction with a Christian or a church ever so they can welcome them and warm them into a community of believers. Don't you see? We don't just simply serve because we're supposed to serve. We serve because serving impacts people, right? That's what we're doing it for. Serving simply impacts people. That's what it's all about. It's what it's always been about. That's what Jesus is telling us it's for. And let, let me... Let me put it very, very directly. This message is not a message of information. It's not just for our head knowledge. It's not just a nice story about a nice Jesus who made a man nice. Jesus is instructing us what to do here. Because when we serve, we can serve in massive, amazing, incredible, life-altering ways. And we can do that to impact people for Jesus. And in the same breath, we can do things that are so simple and so direct and so quick and clean and easy. And we can do that for the purpose of impacting people for Jesus, right? All of it, every bit of service we do, is to impact people to encounter Jesus Christ. Hear me on this. Don't serve at the church because you're asked to. Don't serve at the local food bank because they need a little bit of help. Don't serve your family just because it'll make you seem nice. Don't serve to boost your resume. We serve because simply serving impacts people. Everything we do, 
everything we are, all that we're about is impacting people for Jesus Christ. And you know what? I believe this is a church. This is a place. You are a people. We are a community of believers who all falls under one purpose, to impact this valley and everyone in it for Jesus Christ. Is that right? So if we're going to impact people for Jesus Christ, it doesn't always have to be the ground-shaking things. What can we do to simply serve others so we can show them Jesus, so we can bring them to Jesus, or so we can bring Jesus to them? How do we serve simply? The question that we need to ask ourselves isn't always just how. We need our answer rooted in the why. And if you have an answer to your why, and if your why is because you're ready to impact people for Jesus Christ, then the only question left is how are you going to do it? Because you can do it. You're ready. And it's our time to become so dangerous for Jesus in our community that we are a people of serving in simple ways to highlight Jesus Christ for everyone. And when we do that, we get to live out this message of how the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, and we get to play a piece of that. That's the diamond we turn, and that's what we're about. Will you guys pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you and ask that you guide our steps, you guide our intentions, you guide our desires, you guide... Everything that we are, every encounter that we have, every conversation that we speak, every interaction that happens, Lord, will you guide us? Spirit, will you be in our minds? Will you be in our hearts? Will you guide our eyes and our words to just pursue you and help others to do the same? Jesus, everything we are is for you and about you, and I just pray that you can open our eyes and our minds and our hearts into ways that we can serve simply. What are the things we can do to bring others to you? Because God, it is all for you. Jesus Christ, it is all in your name that we gather together and we worship and we pray and we say in your name, amen.
Would you guys stand with me as we take communion together? We spent this morning talking about how. How do we simply serve in a complicated world? And we pivoted that to the why and how serving simply impacts people. And it's all based around not a how, not a why. It's all contingent on this. It's all based on the who. Not the band, Dad, but the who. Everything we do every single week is about this. We get to gather together, and we are privileged to be in a place where we can come together and remember and honor and even celebrate the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And so as we gather together each week, we take the bread and we remember when Jesus he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is in resemblance of my body that is broken for you. And so each week we gather together and we partake in the bread in remembrance of him and we do this now. And similarly, Jesus took some wine and we have juice and and we gather together to remember when he said, hey, this wine represents my blood that is shed for you. And so each week we gather together and we drink the juice in remembrance of the blood that Jesus poured out on that cross for us. And so we do this today together. Everything that we do, everything we talk about every week and this week included is about this moment. Because we do it all for Jesus. We do it all because he is our God. He is our Savior. He is the one who gave his life for us. And so every piece of what we do comes back to Jesus. And how blessed are we to serve a God who loves us this much. So let's do everything in our power to bring people closer to him even when it comes to simple acts of service for others. So each week we give you tag your it moments of just things to do, challenges for you as you leave this place. The first one is, I want you to simply serve someone tomorrow. I don't want you to like pencil it in for Thursday, okay? Like I want tomorrow, pick someone in your life or someone not in your life, just someone around you. Serve them in a simple way. And when you do it, serve them because you love Christ Jesus and you want them to come to know Christ Jesus. And the second thing I want you to do is I want you to pray for who God is putting on your heart to impact. What is the Spirit speaking to you of a place where you need to be involved in, a place that you need to be impacting in, a people, a person, a group? What ministry, what situation is the Spirit putting on your heart to impact? And then finally, I want you to serve for a tag, sign up for a tag team to serve. I do, and I don't want you to do it just because you think that we need help. I want you to do it because you prayed about it, and that means you know. You know you're ready to make a step towards that direction. You know you're ready to make an impact in that ministry, in that group, in that service. But whatever you do, whether it be with a simple act of service tomorrow, of signing up for a ministry ongoing, or simply just praying out to God that he shows you the ones to serve, I pray and I hope that everything we do can be all pointing ourselves and others to Jesus. Thank you guys for being here. Tag, you're it.